the thing that Aditya mentioned uh, about the uh, in MATLAB that uh, those formulas were not giving. So I used that uh, PyProj library from Python uh, and I tested that uh, what the distances were coming, they were coming normal. Like, uh, so for the same, yeah. So okay. like that, uh, that library's implementation of those uh, functions is like correct. Maybe something is uh, like the point size, uh, the formula itself, something might be wrong. Yeah. So the MSS toolbox may be doing a mistake. No, I think he didn't no, use the toolbox. No, no, sir. I didn't use any toolbox. The formulas that you have written in that uh, document, the mm -hmm. handout, uh, those formulas I used. Uh, okay. Using that, uh, it was giving the wrong values. Okay. Can you also uh, check on MSS toolbox? So what you can do is you can kind of pull the code from MSS toolbox, compare yeah. your code against them. Yeah. yeah. Kind of try to see whether it's going in the same direction or whether there's a mistake. Yes. Okay. Find but out I, uh, my, my handout has a mistake or is it a yeah. mistake in the code? Like I tried to find that book, uh, that uh, GPS introduction to GPS book, that uh, Hoffman well enough, but uh, that book was not available. Those formulas are from that book, right? No, no, no. The, those formulas are from a textbook. Oh. Yeah, that is handbook for marine craft and okay, okay. handbook handbook for marine craft hydrodynamics and motion control. Yeah. That's okay, okay, okay. Yeah, this is the book. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. This is the second edition, but even if you look at the first edition, that also has all the information. Yes. We, you should be able to find the book actually through our library. I yeah, I went to the library. I tried finding it there, but it was not there, sir. Like the there was a section where the book should have been, but it is not. The, all the section uh, behind that are not available. Don't we have online access to it? Yeah, online access we have, yes. Yeah, yeah, we might have online access. We can kind of try to see if you can find online access. If not, then we'll try to do something else for it, okay? Definitely, I'll, I'll provide you the access. The access to the textbook is... <coughs> All right, okay. We will get started, but I'm not sharing my screen, am I? No. All right, so in the last class, we were discussing about the Apkovitz model. So where we were looking at the idea that, suppose I do not want to construct from a first principles approach, but I rather have a model of the craft from which I want to identify what the dynamics for the craft looks like, then there is a way that I can actually use that. Uh, you can perform experiments like uh, straight line tests or turning circle maneuvers, zigzag maneuvers, and similarly other planar motion mechanism experiments in order to identify these so-called hydrodynamic coefficients through which we are kind of finding out what is the external force that the fluid is applying. So the idea here is that this so-called external force, the rigid body external force, which you are seeing here, Wait a second. Why is my pointer not working? Okay, so it's not working. Let me try to open it again. This is where I was. Are you able to see my screen? Not yet. Now? Yes, sir. You're able to see it. Okay. Yeah. So, this so called external force which we are getting, the sway force, surge force, sway force, and the yaw moment, we can try to identify them in terms of Taylor series expansion. And we are considering the Taylor series in terms of these to be functions of x, 
and x here I'm taking as surge velocity, sway velocity, yaw velocity, and then surge acceleration, sway acceleration, and yaw acceleration. Remember that I'm kind of not very precise when I say that these are accelerations. They're not precisely accelerations because they're defined in terms of a body fixed frame. True acceleration is taken as a derivative of the velocity is only valid when we're talking about things in the inertial frame. So it's not in the strictest sense that these are accelerations, but they can be transformed into the accelerations. And in addition to that, I have the uh, roller angle delta. And I'm taking a Taylor expansion of these functions, the external force in surge, sway, and yaw. And I'm considering about an equilibrium point, which is specified here, which is, means that where my craft is moving forward, with a velocity u, capital U, and it doesn't have any other modes, which means that it's not accelerating in sway or yaw. It's not even having a velocity in sway and yaw, and the rudder is set to zero. So in that case, I can express it as a Taylor series expansion, and we saw that these can be expressed simplified using some of the assumptions which we had discussed, that the port starboard symmetry will simplify certain things and we are only considering the first order acceleration terms and then we are looking at the coupling between acceleration and velocity to be negligible so with all of that in case in the most generic case we wrote down the expressions for this x y and z in terms of the partial derivatives with respect to these variables which are in essence nothing but taylor coefficients okay and the idea was that we can we can try to identify these coefficients typically from either a free running model test or you could perform individual planar motion mechanism tests or straight line tests to identify one coefficient at a time and get that information out okay this sort of an approach is particularly useful if i have the model of the vessel that i want to actually find out so if i know particular hulls dynamics i want to be able to characterize it more precisely i can do it using this method the previous method that we had discussed so far where we were looking at cross drag principles and as well as uh, what you call added surge resistance those are first principle approaches even if i do not have the hull information if i don't have any experimental data with me i still can do that in some sense okay Worst comes to worst, I can at least do a CFD analysis to measure out what are the current forces, current coefficients using a CFD program, calculate those values, plug them in there in order to get my values. Okay. Or I can look for similar vessels, find the drag coefficients on them, and then implement that cross drag principle to find, figure out my nonlinear damping and nonlinear uh, reduction in resistance or increase in resistance. Whereas when I want to discuss about a particular hull, this is the approach which is more suitable because you can actually have more parameters to play around with and identify what are the key concerns or key dynamics which are affecting your particular vessel of interest that you're looking at. You'll find that many a times the Apkowitz model is a very popular model. And now some of you might already be knowing that there is another model called the MMG model where they call it as the mathematical modeling group, which is a recent model which has come across in the recent years from the Japanese people, where they have particularly tried to uh, specify the rudder and the propulsion units separately. So here we kind of see that everything is bunched together, right? So when I say X is equal to all of these things, I'm actually including the thrust minus the resistance here, the rudder effects here, here, right here, and they're kind of implicitly taken care of, but I don't have an explicit expression for the rudder and the propulsive forces. The MMG model kind of separates them out and provides a more physics-based approach for capturing the rudder forces and the propulsion forces. Okay, So that's the major difference between the Apkowitz model and the MMG model. Typically, uh, you would want to go with uh, many times, unless until you're kind of looking for precise simulations, one would not want to go with the MMG model 
the APCO, its model is more convenient in the sense that you can identify these parameters, lesser number of parameters from your experimental data, and you can identify them at once. And I mean to say that you can identify them together rather than individually trying to figure out all the parameters in your MMG model. That might be a little more tricky. Okay. All right, and these coefficients, as I said, sometimes they are using planar motion mechanisms and sometimes they are using straight line tests as well. In fact, in our uh, department, we have the towing tank, which is currently under renovation because the new building is coming around it. The moment that thing is complete and it is operational, we might actually try to run a couple of tests and see whether if we can identify some of these coefficients just to see, just to satisfy ourselves at least that the linear coefficients are matching well with what we predict from self-running model experiments or free-running model experiments. Okay. For now, we will be using free-running models to characterize our model and getting these coefficients as the best fit of these coefficients which captures most of the trajectories that I am tracking in a free learning experiment. Okay, so now the so-called model that we looked at here is Apkowitz model is a third order non-linear model, but many a times you might want to kind of simplify this stuff and look at the linear maneuvering model. And when we want to do this, we are kind of saying that the motions are not very sharp, the motions are happening slowly over time. We are not looking at sharp curvature paths. We are not really looking at a separation of flow from the rudder. As long as those conditions are valid, I may be able to get away with most of the linear maneuvering theory. And that kind of stems from your nonlinear theory, but just we are linearizing it more or less. And you would see that when we talked about the maneuvering coefficients in your maneuvering course, we mostly focus a lot on the linear part of the model. So that's why we will not be revisiting the linear part in detail now. And I kind of want to go further beyond onto the nonlinear part and primarily look at control for the nonlinear flat. Okay, but just to, for the sake of completeness, uh, if I wanted to express the linear model, it will be the mass matrix, which will be the combination of the rigid body mass matrix and the added mass matrix times VR dot plus CRB star, which is the linearized Coriolis matrix for the rigid body, plus the linearized Coriolis matrix for the added mass and the linear damping term. All three of them multiplied by VR is equal to tau plus tau wind plus tau wind. And the expressions for CRB star and CA star are given here. And we had looked at this previously, where we had seen that this term here is the monk moment. And it has a destabilizing nature. Okay, for a rudder in a propeller slip stream, you can kind of see that uh, if I look at what is going on, then tau 1, tau 2, and tau 6, which are the forces due to the rudder, can be expressed as minus x delta delta times delta square. And this term typically is quite small. This is the force in the surge direction coming about due to the application of the rudder. It's a small term usually because we have huge thrust acting on that direction. It's not as significant. And generally, when we have the thrust we are adding a thrust deduction factor 1 minus t. So the thrust is actually assumed to be reduced by a factor 1 minus t due to the extra resistance caused by the propeller, which means that imagine now that a propeller was rotating in a free stream and it was getting an inflow velocity. Okay, now that I'm attaching it behind the hull, right? So when I was looking at the so-called bare hull resistance, the fluid was moving past the hull at a certain speed. But now because of the presence of the propeller, it's pulling that fluid. It's like I suddenly I've added a vacuum cleaner in the back of the ship, right? I'm trying to pull that fluid in. So that increased 
velocity of the local fluid near the stern of the ship will result in an increased resistance than what you just saw in the bare hull resistance. Is everybody understanding what I talked about bare hull resistance? What does that mean? What do I understand by bare hull resistance? Like the resistance just because of the geometry of the that move the hull itself moving through the water. How do you get hmm? it? Like propeller behind the ship. Tell me Aditya again, come again. There will be no propeller behind the ship. The ship will be uh, externally moved through the water. And what uh, what will be the resistance that will be calculated? That will be the bare hull resistance. Correct. So we have a carriage which is moving forward with some speed and then to that carriage the ship is actually attached and the ship is kind of being pulled through the water at that particular speed of the carriage. Right? That is the bare hull resistance and there is no propeller unit behind it which is operating. Now when the propeller starts operating and it's in a free running condition, what I am saying is it's actually pulling the fluid faster down the line locally which will cause an increased resistance. I'm taking that factor as a reduction in thrust. It's actually an increase in resistance, but I can consider as if the thrust is reduced by some factor to compensate for it. So that is that so-called thrust reduction factor or thrust deduction factor. A typical value of this T can be somewhere between 5% to 20%, depending on the ship shape. For finer form ships, it generally will be lower. For uh, Full form ships, it generally will be higher. So if I have like a tanker or things like that, I would expect to see a much greater increase in resistance. Okay. So in that case, if I expand out my linear coefficient model or the linear maneuvering model, you'll see that this is the mass plus the added mass matrix. And then I have the damping matrix and the Coriolis matrix, everything combined together. And then I have the final EV, tau 1, tau 2, and tau 6, which is the external force coming into the picture due to the rotor. You will actually find that uh, under this assumption, if you look at it, the surge mode is kind of decoupled from the other modes. Let me try to zoom out a little bit here. Yeah. Can you see, observe that the surge is actually not coupled with any other mode the so-called linear model, right? There are no terms in the surge equation of motion which actually depend on the sway velocity or the yaw velocity. So I'm able to kind of decouple it and bring it out and say that the surge is a decoupled surge system. Whereas the sway and the yaw, I can't decouple them. They're actually coupled. You'll kind of see that there is a cross coupling terms in the added mass matrix as well, as well as in the Coriolis matrix, these values are not necessarily zero. So when I look at the surge and the sway system, I'll actually be seeing a coupled system. And you will see that in that case, I can express the equations of motion as shown here, where M is the mass matrix, two cross two, N is the so-called damping matrix, two cross two, and then I have the Y delta and V delta and delta together in the left-hand side. Uh, sorry, in the right hand side. And this is a model that you have seen before in your undergraduate level course, where we have kind of talked a lot about stability and concerns like that have been discussed in the past. Okay. So it's kind of a tie back to that in some sense. Okay. Now, since this course, we are primarily looking at the so called dynamic positioning operations which usually happen at lower speeds, okay? When I say small, slow speed, I'm looking at speeds less than two meters per second. So in that case, it is more advisable to formulate that uh, uh, a nonlinear model for our dynamic positioning system. Uh, we'll just put whatever things we have learned so far, put them together in a formal sense and be done with it. So in this case, we have the kinematics as eta dot is equal to r times v. And then we have the nonlinear equation of motion, as we have seen here, where I'm kind of combining in this n term, 
the effect of added mass matrix as well as the damping matrix. And the idea here is that when we are looking at a so-called so slow speed, the current coefficients and the damping, the Cx, Cy and Cn can be experimentally determined using wind tunnel experiments or either using CFD as well. You can even perform CFD to find these coefficients. And they can be related to the surge resistance, cross flow drag and month moment, which we discussed in the maneuvering theory previously. Right? So you can kind of get an estimate for those values. And then we can also include the effect of the current here. And that is what we have looked. We have kind of discussed this slightly in the past, but let's make a more formal, uh, what do you call it, discussion about the currents so that we can kind of put this to bed. And you'll see that there is one small difference which I'm going to bring about in the current model as compared to the previous model which we discussed. So previously when we were looking at the direction of the current, we had defined the direction of the current with respect to the north axis, which was our x axis of the NED plane, right? But here it is more common to take the current direction with respect to the ship's heading angle. So with respect to the ship, which direction is the current coming, that is usually more easily identifiable. And so it is better to express it in that sense. So we're going to modify our current formulation slightly in order to incorporate this small little change. Okay, everybody with me so far? Yes? Okay. All right, so as before, we had the velocity vector of the current pointing in some direction. And with respect to the north, whatever is that angle, we are calling that as this fellow, beta Vc, okay, beta due to the current. And then this angle from the north direction to the direction of the heading of the ship, that is called psi. That definition also remains intact. We are not changing anything with respect to this. Now, the only difference is previously we were defining the currents, uh, the gamma C as the angle between the true north and the current speed. But now we will define that value as the angle from the x axis of the longitudinal direction of the board to the direction of the speed or direction of the current. Is everybody with me here so far? Okay, couple of things to note here. One thing, unlike the positive convention of, uh, because the z-axis is pointing downward, most of our angles will be uh, clockwise in this particular case, right? But here we are defining this so-called gamma C as positive in the anti-clockwise direction. Okay, that is the one major difference which you're seeing here. Right? And it is opposite to our previous definition of gamma C that we had taken to be positive in the clockwise direction from the north direction. So previously this beta Vc is what we had as gamma C in our very first when we were discussing about the kinematics of the vessel. Okay? We are changing that slightly here because it's more common to see the uh, current direction expressed in terms of the heading of the vessel not only just because of uh, the convention here, but when we are looking at a dynamic positioning operation, you would not want to actually see the current direction will be changing as the vessel is doing a dynamic positioning, isn't it? The vessel need not always be having a constant orientation during the entire operation. Right? As the vessel's direction changes, so should the current direction also be relative to it changing. Okay. And its effect needs to be captured. And that can be more easily done when I define them in terms of the body fixed coordinate system. So that's why this change we are implementing. Is everybody with me so far? Yes, no? Sir. Yeah. Sir, I don't get it why it is in the anti-clockwise direction. Um, I see. I'm defining it to be positive in the anti-clockwise direction. It's not a question of why. 
I'm saying I'll choose in the anti-clockwise direction as positive. Okay, that, that is the convention I'm putting forth in this particular case, that's all. Yes. All right. It's more of a definition rather than a, it's not coming out of some analysis. I'm defining it that way. Okay, all right. So in this case, uh, this so-called direction of conventions was first proposed by the so-called Blenderman 1994. And it has kind of stuck around. Many people are continuing to use this because it's kind of easy to use. Many data sets have been developed for the computation of current coefficients using this sort of an approach. So that uh, convention has kind of stuck around. So which is why we'll be kind of looking at the same way. So the current forces on a marine craft can be denoted as half rho times the area times the current coefficient times the velocity of the current square. Notice here I'm currently dealing with capital U equal to zero, which means that the craft is at rest. The craft itself does not have a speed. It is at zero speed and there is a current. Then what is the force which is acting on the hull is what I'm determining. Everybody with me so far on this? Aditya? Yes, it is. With me? All right. Yes. Okay. Notice here that the areas are different when I'm looking at the X, Y, and M. So this is called the frontal projected area. Okay. So if I have a ship, this is the body plan, let's say. And let's say this is the draft. It is this area which is denoted by AFC. Okay, so it is the projected area of the hull which is exposed in the search direction. So if I'm looking from the search direction, what is the projected area in the so called YZ plane? Okay, and I'm only interested in the underwater part because I'm looking at the current forces. All right, this ALC, this is the projected area along the longitudinal direction, which means, or sorry, along the lateral direction, which means if I'm looking from the side of the vessel, what is the area which is coming in? So in this case, that would be the underwater area, or the so-called projected area not the wet surface area, but the projected area, okay? Projected area into the center plane. That will be my reference area. That is the how we typically define these coefficients. When I'm looking at the so-called yaw moment, I'm also multiplying this by a length because half rho A times B square still only gives me a force, right? But with yaw, I need a moment. So I need to multiply it by some length quantity. That length is taken as the length overall. So it is the overall length of the vessel that is chosen. Okay. That is a typical convention of how it is done. Okay. So whenever somebody is giving me a current coefficient, generally you would not dimensionalize it with these areas and with these lengths. That is the normal convention. So if I do a wind tunnel experiment and I measure the forces, I typically will divide the force divided by half rho b square times this area, projected area to give me the current coefficient in x direction, projected area in the lateral direction to give me the current coefficient in y direction and so on and so forth. Now you may argue, why is it like that? Why don't, why don't we simply take the wetted surface area? Yes, Joel can come up with a new one and call it his own methodology, but then causes more scope for confusion, right? There should be some uniformity that I did the experiment and let's say somebody else did the experiment somewhere else. If I want to match my current coefficient, there should be some accepted standard. And that standard is just that we are taking these frontal projected area and the lateral projected areas and the length overall whenever we are talking about the current coefficients. It's not that you could not have chosen the surface wetted surface area. It's just a question of convention to keep it consistent across all the different studies. Okay, 
Now, when we do have a shift which is not uh, having a zero forward speed, which means it is actually moving at some forward speed, then we need to figure out what is that so-called relative forward speed of the vessel. And then the velocity which you are using in your force expressions will no longer be the velocity of the current, but you're actually looking at the relative velocity of the current with respect to the ship. So I'm kind of seeing that with respect to the ship, what is the relative velocity of the current? And that is what is getting used in your computation. All right. Similarly, you'll also observe a slight difference that these current coefficients previously depended on the direction of the current. But here, they depend on something different. Direction of the current was gamma C. Here, they are depending on, on gamma RC, which means the relative current direction with respect to the ship will be more important when we are looking at these coefficients rather than the actual absolute direction of the current. So how do I compute these so-called VRC and gamma RC? I can compute them as shown here. So rather than going from top to bottom, I'll go from bottom to top. So I can define what is the small value of the current in the surge and the sway direction. If my current is coming at certain angle, I can resolve its components along the U and the V directions of the ship. Okay? And that is what is given by Vc times cosine of beta Vc minus gamma and Vc times sine of beta Vc minus gamma. If I go back to this picture, I'm actually taking the difference between this beta Vc minus sine. Okay, so I'm kind of trying to figure out the so-called magnitude of the angle, this angle. Okay, so it's kind of telling me relative to my ship's direction, where is the uh, current velocity pointed at and then I'm taking a resolution of it in the two orthogonal directions, one longitudinal direction of the ship, one lateral direction of the ship. That's all. Once I know those two values of the current, I can compute the relative velocity of the ship. So what am I doing? I'm taking a difference between the current surge speed and the current velocity in the surge direction. And then similarly, I'm doing it for the sway velocities as well. I square them and add them and take a square root of that. That is the relative velocity of the current with respect to the ship. Everybody with me so far? Okay. All right. Now I can define that so-called gamma RC angle, which is the A tan inverse or the arc tangent of minus VRC by UC. So I'm taking what is the direction of VRC, which is the direction along the sway direction divided by the surge direction, arc tan of that. That will give me the relative direction of that velocity vector. Okay. All right. So that is how these things are coming in. Now you'll see that from this picture, if I wanted to write down an expression between beta Vc, gamma C and psi, how would I write it down? I, can I write down gamma C is equal to, what can I write it down? From this picture, can you write down gamma C in terms of beta Vc and psi? How do you write it down? Yes, sir. No, we can write it down. Give me the expression. Gamma C is equal to psi minus beta Vc minus pi. Psi minus beta Vc minus pi. Minus pi. Okay. 
everybody is agreeing to this yes sir yes okay maybe the convention of the sign may be slightly different yeah okay yeah i think that's the same so gamma c will be psi minus beta vc minus pi that's what we had to right psi minus beta vc minus pi right so you can see that when u is equal to zero this current direction is given by these two quantities and i can kind of approximate that uh, when i look at what is the value of uc and vc i can express this these two relations in terms of gamma c rather than in terms of beta vc and psi everybody following me what i'm doing is instead of writing uc and vc in terms of capital vc and beta vc and psi i'm expressing it in terms of gamma vc all right so in that case it's easy to see that the expressions for uc and vc can be taken as this and in this case when i take the velocity relative to the current this is nothing but vc square because actually u here is zero and v here is zero right because i'm looking at this case where there is no forward speed correct everybody with me okay so now i have gamma rc and you can actually see that this is nothing but it is equal to gamma c so in this particular case where my relative velocity with respect to the current is nothing but the actual direction of the current which makes sense because the shift itself is not moving anywhere so the direction should be preserved now when i have a forward speed this expression for gamma c no longer holds okay we are kind of the gamma rc and gamma c will no longer be the same things when my u is not equal to zero so for slow speeds uh, where the ship speed is not exactly equal to zero you will find that the relative current direction will be different than what is the actual direction of the current with respect to the heading of the vessel and that needs to be taken into account as our formulation has been developed to take into account all right okay when we do assume the slow speed approximation we can actually see that ur times mod of ur so if i want to compute the relative velocity in the surge times the absolute value of that you can kind of approximate that as minus uc times absolute value of minus uc where here i'm making the approximation that these two are approximately zero so remember that u r is u minus u c similarly v r is v minus v c i am assuming that these two are relatively small is that making sense okay so when i assume that i can put down the expression for u c in terms of v c and gamma c and i'm kind of making a gross approximation here which we already know that it's not a valid expression for u not equal to 0 but assuming the speed of the maneuvers is slow in a dynamic positioning operation i can get away with it and i can get the get these expressions for u times absolute value of u v times absolute value of v and the cross term u times v as these three expressions Okay. all i am doing is substituting vc and gamma c from here into these expressions and getting them that's all everybody with me so far okay all right now typically we can neglect r during a station keeping operation so typically you want to kind of make sure that uh, your r is not varying significantly you are trying to mostly keep a position but you usually have a separate controller 
because you either have a bow thruster or some other mechanism to control the yaw in a dynamic positioning operation, they're mostly looking at the uh, operation in the surge in the sway directions. So we can neglect R during the station keeping and we can approximate that our current forces X, Y, and M, which we previously saw to be like these, is some hydrodynamic derivative, which is a quadratic value in U, V, and V. Is that making sense? What am I doing? I'm trying to say that if I know the current coefficient, how can I find a so-called nonlinear drag value and then use it in my model? That's what I'm trying to make an approximation where the speed is relatively low. Okay, when the speed is very high, this will not be fully valid. Okay, as long as the speed is low, I can make that approximation and I can find out these values out. Okay, so, uh, but I do include this term. So notice that when it comes to your, um, including the so-called hydrodynamic derivative times the absolute value part, but I also include the monk moment separately because it has a destabilizing effect. It is better to capture it rather than not to capture it and later on suffer. So we do capture that as well. So then we can use these expressions to get an idea for Cx, Cy, and Cn in terms of these so-called nonlinear coefficients x, u, u, y, v, v, and v, v. Now, these x, u, u, y, v, v, and n, v, v can be estimated using the ITTC and the cross drag principles that we discussed previously. You can compute them from there and then you can precisely put them in here in order to compute what is your so-called current coefficients for x, y, and n. Okay, notice here that this monk moment terms are nothing but the added mass terms and they usually can be determined from a potential theory formulation. Is everybody with me so far? Okay, so once I have gotten these coefficients, what am I doing? I'm actually now going to come back to my model and make it a little bit more precise for dynamic positioning applications. So I'm going to have the same dynamics, same kinematics as before, same dynamics as before with respect to mass times V dot, CRV times V plus some damping times V, but that is exponentially decreasing with speed. Because I know that when I am looking at high forward speeds, the linear damping plays less of a role and the quadratic damping plays more of a role. We kind of talked about this previously, right? So, which is why this exponential term I'm multiplying there just to make sure that this thing goes to zero or has become insignificant as my speed is increasing, okay? And then I have this so-called nonlinear term the nonlinear damping term, which is now expressed in terms of those current coefficients. Okay. So the idea is that we apply the cross drag principle and the ITTC formulation principle to predict our so called nonlinear uh, expressions. From there, we can define our current values, current coefficient values for low speed operations and then be able to use them in our dynamic positioning model. I hope everybody is with me. Okay. That is what we are doing here. All right. Notice that when we actually do this so-called damping, the current coefficients, they do not provide any your damping. So sometimes what we might do, because if you look back here, these things do not depend on the yaw, right? They depend on the U and the V. 
because we are assuming for most part our currents are irrotational in nature but we do need some yaw damping and that yaw damping will be present in the system so a optional quadratic damping in yaw may be modeled and that may sometimes be used to counteract the monk moment so depending on the dynamics of the vessel that you are looking at where the monk moment is significant you might want to include a nonlinear damping term in yaw as well into your modeling to make it more precise okay here you what we are trying to do is we are trying to make sure that our modeling is rich enough to depict all the dynamics which we see at the low speed when we are looking at a dynamic positioning operation that's what we are interested in doing Okay, the linear damping term uh, is present. We we kind of hold on to it here so that it assumes it ensures that we have an exponential convergence of the system at low speeds. Because when we are dealing with low speeds, some of these terms may be close to zero. Suppose I didn't have any currents in the system, or the currents were small enough, the nonlinear drag may not be significant. Right. at that time the linear drag will be required to capture the dynamics properly so therefore that is why we have that linear damping term there but we have multiplied it by an exponential term so that as speed increases that thing goes to zero okay but at high speeds that this the nonlinear drag dominates over the linear term and how much how quickly or how uh, slowly we should kind of taper off our linear versus the nonlinear tag can be adjusted by playing around with this alpha value right the larger the alpha value we choose the faster it decays now the bigger the alpha value the smaller the alpha value choose it decays down slowly over the forward speed okay. that's the main idea Okay, now if you would bear with me for a minute, I would like to finish this section off. Okay, we'll just extend by maybe five to ten minutes max, but I'd like to just complete this whole thing which we have discussed so far. So notice here that uh, this CRB times V. If we represent the CRB matrix in terms of that so-called representation, which does not depend on our linear velocity, then I can replace that with the, the relative velocity, right? We have seen that before. We can replace that with the relative velocity. So in that case, I can write down this as mass times VR dot plus CRB, which now depends on the relative velocity times VR plus the other terms are the same where I'm taking these dependencies on VRC. Okay, so that completes our so-called non-linear model for the graph when we are looking at a dynamic positioning application. So I can specify it more precisely in this form, play, play around with the alpha factor to make sure that it matches my reality better and then use that for my control purposes, guidance purposes, or navigation purposes. We'll also look at the last thing which we'll look at is a so-called linear time varying DP model. Now, this is a good assumption. You'll see that whenever we are looking at the linear damping, we know that it's a good assumption for low speed applications. And it kind of makes sense because this will be particularly useful in our navigation application. If we specify it as a linear system, we can apply what is called as a Kalman filter in order to fuse our different measurements together. And it makes sense to use a Kalman filter to do the fusion of these measurements to get a precise state of the vehicle. So which is why this linear model might have some applications for us. So we'll just try to derive it quickly and then that's where we will close off. Okay, so this linear damping, you know that uh, it's uh, whenever we're dealing with low speed applications, we already talked about it, that linear damping is a good approximation. 
And here in this so-called linear model, we are treating the ocean currents to be slowly varying bias vectors expressed in the NAD plane. So rather than actually modeling the currents completely on their own, we are making a gross simplified assumption that they vary slowly. That's all. Okay. So you'll see that the modeling is kind of very much simplified, but it still holds some importance for us. Okay, eta, which is our state vector, or at least the position vectors, which denotes the x, y, and the psi, is usually measured using a GNSS and a gyro compass. So we have either a GPS sensor or a gyro compass sensor to measure these values. And psi is measured accurately enough. So we are assuming here that psi of t, the heading angle, is measured accurately enough from our sensors then what we can do is this rotation matrix, which is a nonlinear function of psi, I may somehow assume that I know this rotation matrix precisely at every time step because my psi is known precisely from my measurements. Okay. Is everybody following me? So at, as time is progressing and my vehicle is doing its dynamic operation at any time time, I precisely know my heading angle precisely from these sensors. That's what I'm making an assumption when I'm doing this linearized model. If I make that assumption that psi is known precisely. So psi is not an estimated variable, but precisely known from my measurements. Then I know R of t. I don't have to compute R of t. I know R of t at every time step. Yes. Everybody with me so far? Play along with me. We'll come back to this. Okay, in just a minute. Now, when I look at the now the so-called time varying, linear time varying model for my dynamic positioning applications. So you'll see here that the kinematics eta dot is represented as R of T times V, where this is known to me. I don't have to compute it. Similarly, I have the mv dot plus dv is equal to some rotation matrix transpose multiplied by the bias vector, which is denoting my so-called current effects. And that b dot is equal to zero. That's what I'm assuming. So instead of having the previous modeling where the currents were coming into the picture in a full blown modeling, through the relative velocity vector. I'm here assuming that the currents are slowly varying and there's some sort of a slowly varying force on the right hand side of my system. Okay, so it is a gross approximation of the actual nonlinear model which we saw, but it has use for us when we are looking at it from a navigation perspective. Because in a navigation perspective, what we will do is we'll try to get this bias vector to be as close to zero as possible to get my precise measurements. We'll talk more about it when we talk about the navigation module of our system. Now, if I assume in this particular model that these control inputs, the thrust that I want to apply is some linear function of my actual actuation signal, which is U, okay? Then that results in a linearized system which you see here. So what am I doing? I'm taking a, defining a state vector X, which is a composite of eta, V and the bias, putting all of them together because I have three equations, right? One in eta dot, one in V dot and one in V dot. So I'm kind of putting all of them together in a state space form so that I can express that in a form that can be solved using likes of our ODE 14 right? We want to put them in that form. So what am I doing? I'm putting that, constructing the big state vector consisting of eta, v, and v, and I'm taking a derivative of that. Now eta dot, which is the first term here, okay, that, that derivative will be equal to rotation matrix times v. 
right? Because x is actually the second term in x will be v. Is everybody following me? This thing is eta dot v dot d dot. And instead of this x, I can actually write eta v and b. So that gives me eta dot is r times v. Yes, that's what I had as the previous kinematics. No, I didn't change anything there. Now, my sex, next one is V dot is equal to minus M inverse D times V plus M inverse RT times V. That's what we had before. So I'm taking this term to the right hand side and multiplying the whole thing by a M inverse. That's what I'm doing. Okay, that is how I'm getting these two terms here. And then B dot was zero, so everything is zero in this column. Okay. Now we did have a control input U, so we wanted to specify tau as B times U. So therefore, that's why you're seeing this M inverse times B times U, which is coming into the second equation of motion plus m inverse times w, where w here represents nothing but the tau wind plus tau wave. Okay. I'm just writing that as external disturbances w. Okay. Now, although my state vector is consisting of eta, v and b, my measurement is actually only one of those three. I'm only measuring eta. Isn't it? I just know x, y position and the orientation. That's all I know. I don't know the other things. So my state vectors output, this is my so-called output, is coming as the eta vector plus some noise, which is coming due to the so-called measurements. Okay, so that is the measurement vector. Now this model which we designed is quite an ideal system for using for controller observer design. We can use a linear time varying Kalman filter to estimate the state vector x. We can in fact even use this state space model that we have developed to design for a linear quadratic controller in order to drive our system to any state that we want. More on that when we talk about the navigation module because there are certain properties which have to be satisfied before we can do that. The controllability and observability has to be satisfied by the system. But you can think of this as a simplified state space system in the linear sense where you can kind of Assume that the currents are modeled by a some sort of a slowly varying bias vector. Okay, so I'm taking my measurements from my GNSS and gyroscopes, and I'm continuously integrating my model in order to know the complete state of my vehicle. Since this is linear, this can be done immediately. I don't have to worry about what when whenever I'm getting updates from my GNSS or I'm getting updates from my IMU in terms of gyroscopes, I can update my state and keep going at it using a Kalman filter on this approach. So it is useful for navigation purposes, but it may not be very precise, but at least it gives me a, some sort of a dead reckoning in the absence of any better model to model the dynamics. Okay. We'll see its use really come up when we discuss more about Kalman filters, but I wanted to kind of introduce this model and keep it at the back of our mind. Okay. We'll revisit it when we talk about Kalman filters. Okay, so that's where we shall stop for today. And that will be the last thing we cover. Next class. So tomorrow what we will do is we will cover a little bit about uh, 
wind forces. So we have so far talked about current forces, but we really did not talk about the wind forces. But you will see a very big similarity between wind and current. The way we model the dynamics will be very similar. Okay, And we'll talk a little bit about the wave forces, although I'm not uh, particularly going to dwell deep into it. So from a standpoint of control, we don't usually want to compensate for the first order wave forces and we'll kind of discuss about those ideas. So how to model waves approximately so that we can get away with it. We'll discuss about that. We'll not talk about precise wave modeling. Okay. You have studied about precise wave modeling in other courses and that is very good enough when we want to precisely know the motions of the ship. But our objective here is more in the horizontal plane. So we are more interested in the so-called drift forces due to the wave rather than the first order motions due to the wave. We actually don't want our actuators to compensate for the first order waves because we are wearing out our actuators otherwise. Right? So we want to keep the position, but if the ship rolls, we want to allow it to roll. We don't want to stop it from rolling by using actuators and then wear them out unnecessarily. So our discussion on the wave forces will not be as much in depth. So I, I presume that by tomorrow we should be able to wrap up more or less the environmental forces so that then we can get started with control. Okay, any other questions before I stop? No questions? So in that case, let me stop recording here.